is your other recording on. That's right. Go ahead and put your at the bottom. Can you start our video? Thank you. We're ready now, sorry. All right, I will call the meeting of the September 26, 2022 Board of Supervisors to order. Mr. Neese, can you please do a roll call? Yes. Uh, Mr. Altieri. Here. Ms. Roberts Lightcap. Here. Mr. Partridge. Here. Mr. Russo. Here. Ms. Chanless. Here. Your solicitor, engineer, and manager are here. Thank you very much. We will now move into a moment of silence. Since this is the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, I ask that we, uh, uh, think of everyone who's celebrating this holiday and hope that they have a safe and enjoyable one. We'll now stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Move down to section five, consider the proving the agenda. Is there any, oh, I do have a, uh, a motion to amend the agenda. Uh, it'll be 14.11. The motion will read to approve the retention of a grant writer for an amount not to exceed $3,000 to explore and or pursue available grant for police department equipment. So that is my motion with the motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Is there any board comment? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those, those motion carries unanimously. Section six, public comment. Sure. Uh, that is an action. Then the agenda. Okay. Uh, to, you're taking that action to amend the agenda. You have to take the second action now to actually approve your agenda. But I also would say on 14.7, on we're going to amend that to say not to exceed $10,000. 14.7, not to exceed. Okay. Is Got it. Okay. Is the rest of that fine, Mr. Neese, or do you want? Yeah, to we're going to advertise? eliminate the advertise. Okay. We're just going to hire a search firm, and then, um, but then it's to not to exceed ten thousand dollars. All right. You need a motion for that one as well, Rich. Does it need to be a separate motion? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we'll make a motion to amend the agenda a second time on 14.7 to now reconsider authorizing the staff to hire a search firm to assist with selecting a new finance director not to exceed $10,000. Is there a second? Second. Motion was made by the chair, seconded by Supervisor Roberts Lightcap. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries unanimously. We will now move to approve the uh, amended agenda. I will make that motion. Is there a second? Second. The motion was made by the chair, seconded by Supervisor Chanless. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Now we'll get down to section six, public comment. If there's any members of the public that are here this evening that have any comment that they wish to say for agenda items, please come up to the podium, state your name and address. If you want, Mr. Maloof, you can wait until the they do their presentation on, on the... Uh, on the Culbertson project. Probably more beneficial for you that way. Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll move down to section seven, the minutes, 17, 7.1. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes from the September 12th, 2022 meeting? Second. Motion was made by Supervisor Chandler, seconded by Supervisor Roberts Lightcap. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries unanimously. 
We'll now move down to presentations 8.1, availability of township sewer capacity. Mr. Dave Porter, Municipal Authority Engineer. Mr. Porter, how are you this evening? How are you? Doing well. I do need to note before you start speaking that I have recently transitioned to a new law firm and we are in the process of running through um, additional conflict checks. As such, anything related to this project, I will be abstaining from. Uh, until the conflict check process is completed. Um, so that is my notice to the, uh, to the public. I, uh, I don't think the project specifically identified on the uh, end of here. The project is, thank you for that, Mr. Sikor. The project is related to the BPG Town Center. Um, so I will not be participating in this discussion uh, until such time that I've been granted the approval from my, my firm where no conflicts uh, arise, which could be in a week or so. It just is a lot to get through. Understood. <clears throat> Mic is on. Can everybody hear me? Want me to hold it up here? Or is this fine? Okay. Um, so, uh, again, my name is Dave Porter. I'm uh, with the Authority Engineer's Office um, here this evening to present um, an analysis on residual sewage flow capacity. Uh, within the CDCA service area of the municipality. Um, I'll start the presentation by just saying overall, the township and the authority have an agreement with the CDCA to handle uh, 961,975 gallons per day. Um, the initial planning effort included 250,000 gallons per day, which was initially a seven party agreement. The seven party agreement um, included areas for what was formerly the Alberto Terraza um, project, which included a restaurant and, and some apartment homes. Um, the future Somerset development, uh, it also included a Pulte development, which included residential townhomes um, and a few single family homes and a commercial component that was ultimately sold and developed under another developer, developer's uh, project. Um, which is now the shops at uh, Springton Point. And it also contemplated including some additional residential development surrounding uh, that particular area. So Camelot Lane, where that existing pump station was constructed, handled everything from Newtown Township into the CDCA uh, for a period of time up until the recent Act 537 plan update. So um, to summarize, the seven party agreement included 250,000 gallons uh, of flow per day. Uh, Pulte Springton Point Woods was about 42,000 gallons. The Alberto and Paper Mill Holding uh, planning effort included about 47,000 gallons. The Somerset development included about 85,000 gallons for a total of 173,000 gallons in that service area with a residual of 77,000 for that surrounding residential um, development. So first with Springton Woods, that was developed under three uh, phases. Phase one was uh, 2,600 gallons for 10 single family homes, which is now on Spring, uh, Stony Brook Boulevard. Uh, phase two was actually just the construction of True Farm Road, so there was no flow allocation for that phase. Phase three was about 6,000 gallons for the 27 townhomes on Camelot Lane. And phase four included uh, about 30,000 gallons for 125 townhomes and single, seven single families for the extension of Ellis Avenue. Um, the shops at Springton Point initially uh, included about 3,100 gallons. There was a, an additional planning effort uh, when a use changed there. So that planning, that Flow allocation was increased slightly to about 5,000 gallons per day um, for a total of 43,393 gallons. Uh, Somerset development. Oh, Dave, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can, yes. can I ask questions as you go along? Because instead yes. of jumping through At the to board's these, pleasure. Um, so for this, for this Pulte, um, Springton Point Woods, this is completely built out now? That's correct. Okay. And so that's that's their number. So there's no nothing taken from that. That's correct. This. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Um, the Alberto Terraza and Somerset developments initially were planned for forty six thousand seven hundred twenty gallons. 
Uh, actually, only phase one of that was ever constructed, which included 103 apartments in three buildings instead of what was originally planned as 226 apartments in six buildings. Uh, the 300 seat restaurant was included in that planning effort uh, initially and in the phase one development. Um, so the limited amount of flow that was used for that was 22,120 gallons per day. Uh, there was a residual from the 123 apartments that were never constructed of 24,600 gallons per day. And we know, I'm sorry to interrupt. That's okay. um, um, and so we know that just so I can, I didn't get the map uh, in the original uh, thing. So I'm, I'm trying to catch up with this and I apologize. Um, so this 24 is, they can't build this 123 apartments on That's the correct. site, correct? Yes. Okay, so there's no chance so, of this being coming in and saying they need this 24,000. That's correct. So okay. up, up on the, the map on the overhead, the red area is what was Alberto Terraza phase one. Um, that actually, the, the red area and blue area were actually kind of uh, overlapped in, in their initial planning efforts. Um, so the red area shows three apartment buildings and the restaurant. Um, there's obviously no other area that can be developed in that, that section. For that terraza. Um, now the, and the Benson is on, a, on the Somerset. Okay, I'll let you go. Sorry, Dave. No I had a quick question, Dave. Sure. So you're saying that a townhome is allocated 223 gallons per day and a house is 263 a day? Based upon this calculation, is that a standard? The initial planning effort included a, a various mix of flow allocation. Um, when we did 537 planning, 262 and a half gallons per day for existing resident, residential was the standard. 225 gallons per day for new residential was the standard. Um, by contrast, the Ashford development, which is now Lissiter, came in and they were allocated 250 gallons per day per residential unit. How um, is that calculated though? Is that, is that based upon like um, some kind of engineering calculation? Yes. Yeah, the Municipality, municipality Authorities Act um, in with the tapping fee calculation allocates, I think it's 90 gallons per day per capita. Um, per person? Per, yes. So if you have so, five people in the house, it's, it's it's Correct. So it's that. based on the average uh, average household, which okay. through five thirty seven plan was about two and a half people per household. I think it ended up coming out to like two hundred twenty four point one gallons. You rounded it to two twenty five for simplicity. Okay. Thank you. So the Somerset uh, development initially included planning for 85,000 gallons per day. Um, that development actually never took off. Um, it was replanned uh, using some of the residual flow from the Alberto Terraza initial planning effort. So that 24,000 gallons, that was residual. Um, Suzanne, if you move to the next slide. It kind of shows the initial planning for Alberta was 70, 46,000. Somerset was 85 for a total of 131, 720 gallons. You know, if you, if you take out the phase one terraza, which was built with the 103 apartments and the restaurant, that's the 22,120 gallons. The remaining for the replanning effort was 109,600 gallons. Um, what was called the integrated planning uh, effort included 250 apartments, which was formerly the Bazudo development. Um, and that was at an allegation, allocation of 200 gallons per day per unit. Um, the uh, replanning effort also included the 137 townhomes, which was formerly Muirwood at 225 gallons per day per unit. And that was a total of 80,825 gallons. And then the residual from that is 28,775 gallons. So looking at what was left from the initial Alberto, the redevelopment effort that, that you know, had 109,000 gallons remaining, the replanning effort only 
required 80,000 gallons. So the residual capacity that was not allocated was 28,775 gallons per day. Um, and just by reference, the seven party agreement spoke to what was planning flow. And it also spoke to uh, agreement flow, which the agreed flow to those developments was 135,000 gallons. And during the 537 planning effort, it was unclear where that residual flow um, needed to be assigned to. So we took that 3,280 gallons and just used it as a placeholder in the 537 plan. It was just something that was a difference between what was the planned flow and what was in the agreement. So we used that as a placeholder. So for the remainder of the flow that was not allocated, at 28,775 gallons per day, plus the 3,280, which was remaining from the seven party agreement, there's a residual flow in total of 32,055 gallons per day. Now with the Benson office buildings, you, do you have a number assigned to, we don't know what that's going to be though. We don't know if it's gonna be a, an apartment building. We don't know if it's gonna to be townhouses. We don't know. Correct. What it's going to be. So how do we how do we make sure that we're covered for that piece? Because you've got sunrises accounted for, but what about that piece that's for sale in front of Sunrise that's owned by Brandywine? Do we know what that piece is, or is that part of this at all? Yeah, it's it's not part of this. The Benson office buildings we do account for, um, and that stems from our conversation with the DEP and going back and forth and identifying where the residual flow was coming from. Um, we went back and forth with them for uh, consistency with what we had on record as far as planning module approvals and planning exemption approvals and what they had. And then we rectified those flows. And in going through that process, we identified that the Benson and office buildings needed to have something allocated to them, which we looked at the square footage for office use and we assigned, uh, I think it's a 10th of a gallon per square foot of gross floor area. And it ended up being like 35 or 3,900 gallons per day. So we did include that in this calculation and that comes a little bit farther down in the presentation. What um, happened? Okay. And then the sunrise, we based that directly on water usage. Um, so that is also included in, in the uh, tabulation. Right. Now, what happens if Benson is not an office use? Because we found, you know, we had, this is why we're here right now, because Ellis was supposed to be retail. It's turned into residential. So that's how come there's a, a um, that's why we've got to kind of re, um, sure. re uh, move around some of these numbers. Right. So if it were resident, how much, so you said it's 30, 30 something hundred. Um, right, 3,500? 3, yeah, 3,550. 3,550 3, for yeah. office, and we know that mm -hmm. office is a lot less. Mm -hmm. So what is a, I, I mean, I don't even know how many houses or, or condominiums or, you know, if you do these stacked mm -hmm. um, townhomes, how many can fit on that parcel? Um, so how do we, is there, a, is there a, I don't know. I'm just worried that, you know, if we take that away, then, you know, we have a developer who comes in to do this and then we're, uh, yeah. we don't have it again. I completely understand um, that the mechanism for that would be a, a planning module. So whatever developer would come in to, to do a project or development on that site, their mechanism for determining what flow is required would be a planning module, unless the township went through an, a comprehensive 537 plan update, which typically a development is handled by planning module. Um, I think when I get through the rest of the okay, presentation, sorry. I think you'll find that there's there's additional flow that could be allocated. Okay. I'm to, sorry, I keep interrupting future. you. No, that's okay. That's fine. Um, Suzanne, if you want to go to, uh, I guess, slide 14. Uh, so that what we're skipping over is just a, a breakdown of you know, what went from Alberta to Raza to their, their phase one development to Cornerstone and showing basically what the residual flow was there. So uh, if you look at the sewage planning total proposed development for the seven party agreement area was about 146,000. We did look at additional flow that needed to be accounted for for the sunrise assisted living and the Benson office buildings. 
which tabulated to 156,000 gallons per day. And then moving on, um, but the next slide is directly from the Act 537 plan update in the area highlighted in red. Suzanne, back up. No, I'm sorry, go down one, please. Go down one, right there. So the area highlighted in red is basically the, the five, uh, sorry, the seven party agreement area. Uh, next slide. So the area highlighted in red included the existing development around the Camelot service area, the Pulte residential, the Alberto Terraza, Alberto's restaurant, um, the proposed cor Somerset and Cornerstone uh, development, and then also I accounted for uh, the remaining flow not assigned of 28,000 gallons, and then the remaining flow from the seven party agreement, which was the 3280. Um, there was also just below there, there's a 21,325 gallon uh, per day infill pot of flow. That was from the original Act 537 plan update. That looked at everything that was going to be connected to the 961,975 gallons per day. So aside from what's residual in the seven party agreement, there was initially a 21,325 gallon pot of infill that could be assigned essentially anywhere else in the municipality. Typically that's used for, you know, vacant lots with new construction and, and they, that can be assigned through, um, you know, a planning exemption or an application mail. So the next slide identifies uh, 32,055 gallons a day and that is the residual from the seven party agreement. In the parentheses down below, if you include the infill, there's actually 53,380 gallons per day available. And then moving on, that is the initial planning effort that the township undertook through 537 planning. So the way that we monitor connections and flow on an annual basis is through chapter 94 reporting, which is an annual waste load management report. We look at uh, projected connections for all current development and proposed development that's active in the township. So table 4A is what we submit to the DEP as part of that report. The blue area at the top is essentially the Ashford service area in the Act 537 plan update. The green area is the BPG Ellis Preserve project. Next slide. The orange area is everything that's uh, contributory to the Camelot service area. Um, the area in red again is identified as what was uh, seven party agreement. Uh, next slide. So starting with the top right, there's 191,000 gallons a day of flow um, on an average basis that was at the Camelot's uh, pump station for 2021. There's also a pump station that formerly took the Springton Point Estates wastewater treatment plant and replaced that. And it's now receiving flow from those residents, uh, pumping it over to the Camelot's uh, pump station. So I'm backing that flow out because it was not part of the initial seven party agreement. So looking at what was, um, what was being contributed to Camelot station on a 2021 was 168,000 gallons approximately. So if I include the flow for the Benson building, the two residual flows for the seven party agreement, I end up with a total of 204,202 gallons a day um, that's spoken for in the seven party agreement. And you'll see on that slide as well, Suzanne, Go back to number 22. Right there. So on the, on the bottom in yellow is the infill again. And because we're going through actual flow through the chapter 94 reporting, rather than planned flow, the infill number goes up because essentially you're planning for a house at 225 gallons per day being connected. Most cases they're using 170 gallons or 180 gallons a day. So there is some residual that ends up going back into um, an infill pot for the authority to reassign. So 
again, that's just a breakdown for residual flow, uh, identifying the 32,055 in the, in the seven party agreement. Um, if we're looking at a, an actual flow basis, there's about 46,000 gallons um, that's available there. Um, in addition to that area, there is planning that was initially done for the Melmark School, which is up in the northeastern or northwestern portion of the township. Um, the Act 537 plan allocated about 25,000 gallons a day to the Melmark School. Um, through their water usage records, it was determined that they only needed about 19,800 gallons. That was done through an agreement with the municipal authority. Um, and actually, there's a, about 5,200 gallons per day of residual flow there that was available. Um, the Stony Knoll 13 lot subdivision that the board um, um, saw recently come, come through the township um, asked for 2,900 gallons per day. So our capacity analysis allowed for a portion of that Melmark flow to be reassigned. Um, they're going through sewage facilities planning to reassign that flow, um, but that leaves ultimately 2,275 gallons per day left out of that that could be reassigned. So in summary, the seven party agreement flow, the flow from Melmark uh, leaves 34,330 gallons per day available. There's an additional 33,665 gallons of infill that's available for a total of about 68,000 gallons a day uh, that's available for reallocation um, to development in the township. Any questions from the board? <clears throat> yeah, I just have a couple questions. So is, um, if this is something that you're able to answer, I'm not sure, but uh, if <clears throat> is DEP approval of the real reallocation, is that something that's guaranteed? Approval of the reallocation for um, the Melmark portion or well, any portion in general? Well, yeah, just because, I mean, this isn't what I do normally. So, um, but my understanding was that we were being asked to um, lend um, from, our, from the township reserve, right? Mm -hmm. Until there was DEP approval of reallocating these other, you know, whatever is available from other projects. So, so, so basically we're waiting for that approval. So I guess my question is, is, is that approval guaranteed? Well, I, I can't speak for the DEP. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't guarantee anything uh, from the DEP, um, but I can say that if, if through a planning effort, there's always a planning component and a capacity component. The planning component is the township's responsibility. The, the capacity component is the authority's responsibility. Um, we would certify. We, as the authority, would certify that the capacity is available. If the township signs off that the planning is consistent with their Act 537 plan or with their comprehensive plan and zoning and all that, um, the DEP would likely grant that approval. Okay. You can't think of a, like, I mean, a reason why they wouldn't. Other than if typically what holds up planning approvals is capacity. That's, that's typically what, if there's not sufficient capacity somewhere in the township system or in another entity system that convey, conveys flow downstream or the treatment plant, that's something that would, would hold uh, that development up. Okay. And then if, if we do lend out something from the township reserve, um, <clears throat> from the township's reserve, what, how do we, how do, is there, how do we get that back? If there, if for some reason there wasn't a DEP approval, is there a mechanism that we can get that back or, or increase the township's reserve in another way? That's a, a good question. Um, typically, I think the way that you would handle that would be through an agreement with the developer that if, if that flow was not allocated through planning by DEP, then there would be some mechanism that triggers release of that flow back to the authority or the township to reallocate. For the purchase, for the purchase of additional flow from somewhere else. Um, okay. Dave, Correct. Yeah. Um, now we have parts of the township residents 
who are still on septic. Um, Harrison, my Har 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 Harrison, Harrison State, States, yeah. they're still not on. And I know they're not part of this CR through the, on this part. Because there are RHM, is that? That's correct. It would likely be in the RHM service area in that section. Is, do we have capacity to, through the RHM, to, to give them sewers? I know I'm putting you on the spot. I'm, I'm going to say probably not at this point, considering what I just saw from Culberson Elementary or seeking two EDUs. And I think the RHM has an issue with capacity in granting that flow to them. Now, if we can't service that part of the township with the RHM, can we use this, this capacity to service them? I know it's far yeah, away. Theoretically, but. yes, but a significant planning effort would need to be undertaken. Um, not only would the municipality have to update their Act 537 plan, but the CDCA would have to agree to amend their service area map. And then all the other municipalities that are, are, are part of the CDCA would have to agree to amend the map to out, uh, allow for that flow to come into the system. Right. Now, how much, because um, when, when approval was made for this new, for this change in this development, we were told, or I, I maybe I, I believe that we were told that there was sufficient capacity. Um, so I'm just, I'm just nervous because we have residents who don't, and I understand it would be involved to get, you know, to have this other change, but these are residents. And they've been residents, and and if they need sewers, you know we have to make sure that we cover our residents. Um, how much does um, Equus need in order to? Well, how much are they asking for? They were asking to borrow uh, fifteen thousand gallons per day uh, in the short term. Um, the rest of what I included in in my presentation does go through what they've previously planned for and have constructed, and then also what they're asking for in the subsequent phases to build out the Ellis Preserve. Um, so all told, they would need a total of 36,700 gallons to complete the development based on the planning documents that I've been given. Uh, for what they want to complete in phase two, sector one, phase two, D, and E. But we don't know if that's all of it in order to finish their, I, I don't know what sec sector, you know, I know that they're coming in because they've got, um, uh, they need to finish up the um, catering facility and right. the um, okay, office that. building because they have Please a tenant. So this is the overall development. The areas in blue, cross hatch in blue, are areas that are tributary to the CDA service area. Um, starting at the top is the Toll, uh, Toll Brothers townhouses that was in uh, phase three of the development that's <laughs> built out. Um, moving down along the right hand side, that area that's identified as 1A was the multifamily development. Um, that's constructed, completely built out. Um, so the Toll Brother townhouses, uh, let's see, there were 76 towns at, uh, I'm sorry, they were, I think there were 76 towns at 17,000 gallons per right, day. Right, and, and all of these are serviced, right? They all They're met. all serviced. So what they're, what they're developing now is this area down here. That's, that's all that's left for them. One uh, C and out. one D, right? One, yeah, the one D area is already built. That's actually tributary to RHM. Area that's one C is the proposed sector one phase two commercial. That's oh, RHM that we had a problem with getting our elementary school yes. addition yeah. done. Okay. Yeah. But that Good was, that was constructed in 
that was actually the first development I think that they um, constructed out there started in what 2012 ish 2013. Probably 2015, because I think it was done right after I came. Okay. I think that used flow from the old ARCO <clears throat> facilities. Yes, that's correct. So they, they actually they demoed some existing uses and reallocated some flow to cover that. I think they may have purchased an additional 15,000 from RHM, if I don't if I recall correctly. Any other questions from the board? No. Ed, do you have any questions? No, I'm good. All right, thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Um, I don't know if this is, this is an agenda item under 14.4, um, but what I think the board is most likely going to do is to allow our solicitor to have a conversation uh, and see what sort of resolution can come up with. Is that my understanding? My understanding correct, I should say. I think that silence is a yes. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Nice, what do you need? I was gonna say, do you need Dave to stay for anything else or can we release him? Anyone else from the board? No, thank you, Dave, for your um, patience and your information. I, I mean, if I just, it. so, I mean, if you're going to talk to, you're still going to do 14.4 uh, as a separate item when, it, when we get to it? Well, I think that, I, I think that the, from the board, I think that they uh, would rather have you. Would, I don't think anyone's comfortable voting on this tonight, okay. even with that presentation. Uh, that's at least just, I'm not hearing any objections based off of the prior conversations from the individual conversations from when this information was presented to us, right? So I think that what the board is more comfortable with is for you to have a conversation and see if there's any sort of resolutions that can be brought up and then bring them, bring them to the board for um, resolution. So 14.44 is gonna get tabled. That, that's safe to say that. I would. At that time, I'll go and do that. Okay. I, I was just going to say, if you're going to go forward without Mr. Porter, if like that's why I was saying it now, so we can get out of okay. here. All right, we'll move down to eight point two, the twenty twenty three proposed other funds budget presentation by Mr. Lafiata. So at this point in time, <clears throat> we're going over the general fund expenses as well as the general fund revenues, um, as well as the capital items. So this is just all the other funds outside of the general fund and the capital fund. So starting with the streetlight fund, this is the, um, the fund that pays for the, pretty much the electricity for the streetlights as well as some capital improvements. This is collected from homes that are within 250 feet of a streetlight. We're proposing a $46,000 2023 budget. And moving on to expenses, uh, your main expenses you're gonna see is electricity, um, the street light replacement program, which is the, the large increase this year, $20,000, as well as an interfund loan agreement back in 2016. Uh, the street light funds borrowed money from the capital fund for the, the major overhaul of the LED program. So this is a 13 year loan that we pay back every single year until that loan is uh, satisfied. Lights. It's for a replacement program, much like we do with the road program and the vehicle replacement program. We're going to allocate $20,000 for LED lights every year for the next so many years? That would be correct. Yes, that's a... How many lights do we have? I'm not 300. sure. 300. And how much? They're all LED now. Correct. They're all LED. And what's the life expectancy of an LED street light? About 15 years. 50, how many years? 15. 15. One five. And how much did it cost us to, for, for light? Do you have it, was, it, was, it was about 170, 
thousand dollars when we put them in based on uh, another piece of your evening this evening, we think that replacement cost is going to be right about 200,000. And that's the reason for the 20,000. 10 years would be when we're anticipating the street lights would be need to be replaced. So we own the street lights. We pay Pico for the electric. It, it's a, it's basically like a tap fee. So it's not a metered electric. It's a, you, it's a tap that you, Every time but, but you all the street lights in town are owned by us. Um, most of the street lights in town are owned by us. Some are owned by some HOAs. So I, okay. I just want to be so careful. Let me rephrase that. So the lights that we're putting in this budget. Yes, this they're all owned by budget. us. That's correct. Eco doesn't own the lights. They just provide the power. That's correct. And that's typical for all the towns around us? That is typical for any town that I know of, yes. So if a light breaks, gets hit and breaks, we, we send our guy out to fix it? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. So moving on to the next slide, um, we're projecting to end the year uh, with about $101,000 in fund balance. And uh, as you can see, the revenues don't match the expenses. So if the board would choose to use fund balance to balance that budget, um, we're projecting at the end of 2023, you would have about $77,000 in uh, fund balance remaining. Moving on to the hydrants. Um, hydrants are collected for homes that are within, I believe, 780 feet of a hydrant. Uh, about 86% of the homes in the township are within the 780 feet of the town of a hydrant. Uh, we're proposing $104,000 for the 2023 revenue budget. And moving on to expenses, we're projecting about $100,000 in expenses. And this is just hydrant rentals. Unlike the street lights, we don't own these. Aqua owns these. We just rent them off of Aqua. Yep. The uh, fire hydrants in the HOA, do they own them or does Aqua own them? I, be I believe that Aqua would own them. Yeah, I, yeah, I think most of the time Aqua owns them. There, there's a, I don't know that's a hundred percent the case. You know, a couple of the HOAs, um, so, they may own them. The ones that are located in the in there. So, but because so the rental the expense money. includes if the fire department has a fire and they they take the water, that's included in that rental fee. That's correct. Okay, Thank that's you. correct. So we're projecting to end the year with about sixty-seven thousand dollars in fund balance and. Um, in this case, the revenues uh, are a little bit higher than the expenses. So we would actually increase our fund balance to 72,000 uh, at the end of 2023. Moving on to our ARPA revenue, this is the $1.4 million that we received from the federal government for um, the, the pandemic. In early 2020. Two, the board passed a resolution to use this for stormwater. Um, so those are the expenses that you're gonna see. Uh, we're proposing, uh, we're projecting to spend about 442,000 this year and spend the remaining um, 1 million in 2023. All the funds must be expensed uh, by 2025. So as you can see here, at the end of 2023, we'll have a very uh, minimal fund balance of about $2,600. Moving on to our note uh, proceeds revenue. This is leftover uh, dollars from the loan that we took in 2020 for the road program. The only thing outside of the use of fund balance here is you're gonna see a small bit of interest. Uh, on to expenses, we're proposing using the remaining $55,000 for a uh, small portion of a road program in 2023. And that will be the remaining dollars in the note proceeds funds. Uh, Rich, I thought we were using, and I could be off. I think we're projecting to use about thirty thousand this year. Correct. And then twenty five thousand. Correct. correct. Thirty thousand this year. There's about eighty five left. So and that's that's related to Springdale Point. So that would actually uh, eliminate this fund moving into twenty twenty four after everything's expensed. Much like the note proceeds, we have our bond proceeds. This is left over from the 2016 borrowing for, for the building. And the only revenue you're gonna see there is the interest. 
And much like the no proceeds, we're going to use the remaining funds, $65,000 in 2023 for a new roof um, on this building. And that will close the bond proceeds fund. Next you're gonna see is the war on drugs. This is the money that we get from drug forfeitures, uh, small amount of interest for revenues in 2023. And expenses, you're gonna see uh, $15,000 projected in 2023 and, I'm sorry, in 2022 and 15,000 in 2023. Uh, that is for a replacement vehicle for the vehicle that was just in an accident. We believe that we're gonna, uh, the insurance isn't gonna cover the full cost of the vehicle. So, so you don't believe the insurance is or the insurance is? It's short, it's not gonna be, we can't, they're not gonna. It's, it's very similar, I, if, if, I don't mean to cut Rich off, but it's very similar, if you, have, if you have a 2014 vehicle and you go out and you wreck it, they're gonna give you whatever book value was for 2014. <laughs> that doesn't give you the replacement cost of buying one that's in 2020 or whatever year it is. And so that's, that's what's happening with that. So they, you know, the car had a value to us, that was probably greater than the, what the value of the insurance company gives you, but that's that's normal. Just like you know, if you wrecked your own car and it was total, so you you would get enough. You would get whatever the value book blue book value of the car was at that time. So this this person hit this car, this police car, at an accident, totally. Yes. So their insurance company is giving us this money. So we have the opportunity to go after that insurance company and tell them we will sue them if they don't give us the difference to make it up to replace the police vehicle. I, we, we, we obviously I, I mean, have this, the opportunity. This, but this, I this person shouldn't have been driving to begin with that they hit a police vehicle at an accident. Okay. So in my opinion, there should be a negotiation with that insurance company. I don't think we should be paying for this car, in my opinion. That's, I'm just one person, but I, strong, I, I feel very strongly about that. This was an accident. There was this, there was accident vehicles all the way around this thing. And this person lost control of their vehicle in an area where you shouldn't lose control of the vehicle. It's not on the highway. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just going to say, I mean, if it, if it happened to me, I would be negotiating with the insurance company. And then I would probably also buy a car that cost whatever they gave me. But that's just me. Well, and, and normally would, we no, would. I wouldn't buy a new one, you know. Yeah. And, and let me just explain. I mean, normally that's what I would say. Like that's what I would do, right? You know, I mean, if, if they, I believe they're giving us thirty six thousand or something like that for the for the vehicle that was a two thousand and sixteen. The problem that we have is that as a township, as a municipal government, to go out and buy a used vehicle is not. It's not. It's not like I can go and say I want to buy this used vehicle. I can't just go off the lot and buy one. I have to go through a bidding process, and so to go through the bidding process when you're buying a used vehicle is a lot more difficult because it's like we say we want these features and then you get somebody that bids and comes out with a car that's got you know a dent all the way down the side of it and says we'll sell it to you for this well that's not the lowest responsible bid right you know so it, it's a little bit more of a challenge um and so of course we looked at replacing it as new we we, we were going to look at replacing this vehicle probably in another year or two years anyway. So, but that that that's the challenge that we're stuck with. Anytime we, we get one of our vehicles, it's really hard just to go back and buy a used one. We've looked at it even for the public works team. They they would like to get a used truck, but to find the used truck, it's it's just very difficult. And it's very difficult to then turn around and well, that's the problem. I mean, that, that makes sense to me, but then I agree with what Mike said. I think we should be well, the problem is that 2016 vehicle, I don't know what what kind of condition was in it's five years old, seven years old, whatever it is, it's gonna be seven years old. But the problem is today, all vehicles are elevated in price, you sure. can use vehicles. So if you're only gonna give us $36,000 for a vehicle, which I don't even know how many miles it had on it, but it's, it's got all the police equipment in, we've got to re-outfit it all. I mean, is, is, this, the, is this, this the cost to get the vehicle fully outfitted and everything? Like, like this is a specialty vehicle. This is not like Mrs. Jones is, no, exactly. 16 Tahoe with 150,000 miles on its beat to crap. So our, what we're fighting with the insurance or discussing with the insurance company, I shouldn't say fighting because they haven't said no. Uh, what, what our conversation was, was that the, the, we are removing the equipment from the old vehicle that was obviously not damaged, taking that out. As we get a new vehicle, what we don't know is two things. One, right now, what it's gonna to cost to install all of that in the new vehicle. And two, 
we don't know what it's going to cost. Like, will the box that fit this 16 or 17, what I don't know the exact year, but whatever year it was, will the box that was in there fit in the 2020? two vehicle. I don't know that yet. Well, that's and what I mean. We need, we need so, to understand the cost because it's one thing if, if that's the vehicle, but this vehicle is a specialty vehicle. Correct. It's just like if they ran the street sweeper over and it damaged the street sweeper. You don't just take it as a truck. You take it as a specialty piece of equipment that might cost 10 times as much to fix as, as a railer truck like that. So this, this is similar as specialty equipment for a special purpose. We need to make sure we're getting covered. I mean, if this is a differential due to the fact that of its age, okay, but we shouldn't burden the taxpayers on putting this equipment out, pulling it out and putting it back in a new one. That should be part of this insurance company's coverage. And we should have a professional quote from the company that does it for us because we send it to a specialty place. Yep. We're not doing it in the, back here in the garage. We send it to get it's a special, it's a, it's a special company that does it. So like, so if, if you think it's worth X, it might be it might be two or three X, and they might not know that. So I just and, think and we that's need to exactly have a little bit better information. Doing. I think we need better information. I'm, I'm not saying this is wrong in the differential of the year of the vehicle, but I want to make sure we're not expending funds to transfer, remove, and put into the new vehicle. Gotcha. So um, with that being said, we'll go back and get some clarification from the insurance company. We're actually just waiting on an answer from that. But um, for this purposes, we're projecting that we're going to end the year with about $16,000 in fund balance. And then um, if we do expense the $14,900, um, next year we'll end with about $1,100 in fund balance. Next is our police donations. The main source of revenue here is donations and interest. And on the expense side, uh, we're proposing some bulletproof vests. It's what traditionally we do for about $6,000. So um, we're projecting to have a fund balance of about $39,000 at the end of 2023. And if we use the 5,800 in fund balance, we'll end with about um, $33,000 in fund balance at the end of 2023. Moving on to open space. Open space is uh, the main Revenue source here is a small bit of interest. Uh, we're proposing about $30,000 in 2023 to create some sort of parking feature, um, maybe a gravel parking lot for the meadow preserve. So we're proposing that, we're, or we're projecting we're gonna have about $91,000 in fund balance at the end of 2020, 2022. Um, and then if we expense the 29,000 in fund balance in 2023, we'll end the year with about 61,000 Moving on, the next is stormwater. Uh, we're looking at about $2,600 in interest for revenues for stormwater, and then approximately about $50,000 um, for stormwater expenses. This includes the NP, NPDES permits, as well as uh, the 10 year stormwater inspections. So we're projecting that we'll have about $260,000 in fund balance at the end of 2022. And if we use the $47,000 in fund balance, that brings us to about uh, 213,000. Last but not least is our liquid fuels fund. Um, main sources of, it, of revenue here are our interest as well as our state allocation. We just got word that we're gonna get um, about 433,000 in liquid fuels, which is um, I believe up about 20,000 from current allocation. Um, and on the expense side, we're looking at about 511,000. This is for our 2020 road program debt service payments. So at the end of 2022, we're looking at about $259,000 in uh, projected fund balance. And then if we use the uh, gap fund balance, uh, we'll end the year uh, with a projection of about 183,000 in liquid fuels funds. And that is a short presentation on all the other funds outside of the general fund and the capital fund. Thank you, Rich. I do, uh, before I turn it over to see if there's any board uh, members that have any comments, this is obviously the first meeting since you have uh, accepted a new position. So I just wanna say that on behalf of the board, we appreciate everything you've been doing for the last almost eight years. 
um, your leadership in the finance department, your ability to um, translate at many times complex uh, financial information to the five of us, as well as to John and, and Linda, uh, who were here when, when you were first hired. Uh, we wish you all the best of luck. This is obviously something more formal will be coming, but with your uh, resignation on the agenda that I don't think we're going to approve tonight, uh, I do <laughs> want to wish you congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations and good luck in your new uh, your new endeavor. Their uh, what is it, Lower Providence? Yes. Lower Providence gain is Newtown Square's loss. So thank you very much. We wish you all the best of luck with that. Um, outside of that, uh, personal antidote. Is there any board comment with regards to the presentation that we just heard? As always, Rich, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to move down to the reports. Uh, I do want to note too that the board and I kind of went out of order here. The board did meet, so Suzanne can have this uh, in the minutes. The board did meet prior to this in executive session where we discussed personal and legal matters. Uh, I forgot to make that disclosure in the beginning, but when I move down to section nine, nine point one, report from the police department, Chief Lund, do you have anything you need to supplement? Thank you very much. Report from the fire department, Chief Everloff, do you have anything you need to supplement? Uh, there goes that role we almost had, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Now we appreciate it, Chief. It's a great event. It's a good community event, and obviously it all goes to a good cause. How many people ran the 5K? Over 200. Ah. And you came in at 200, so, right? So 50, 53rd is not a bad time, right? Is that what you're telling me? Uh, Just wanted to make sure that was on there. It was 153rd place. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly it. The only other thing I want to mention, so the fire company, Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Move down to a report from the Public Works Director, Mr. Sharrett. Do you have anything to add? No. Supplement? Thank you very much. How about building and codes? Mr. Rezcheck is not here, so nothing to add. Mr. Lafayette, do you have anything to add for your finance report? No. Perfect. Library Director, Ms. Caruso is not here, but congratulations on the record-breaking summer that they had. Over 12,000 items that were out of circulation in August alone, which is the first time ever in Newtown Township. So congratulations to them. Mr. Johnson, do you have anything as the township engineer? Is your microphone on? Rookie mistake. Not, now it is, yes. <laughs> uh, I'll just add the Echo Valley culvert replacement project. Uh, notice to proceed uh, is today, and we anticipate the contract. We'll start working on that uh, later this week. Uh, we'll go from there. Uh, and I'll be working with the solicitor jointly on the, uh, the soil nailing uh, within the winding way right away, working through the agreements and the cost estimate um, on behalf uh, with the solicitor on that one. Perfect, thank you very much. Any questions for the engineer? Seeing none, we'll down, move down to the township manager, Mr. Neese. Yes, I have a, just a couple of quick things. One is uh, we're gonna do a team building exercise on the 21st and it, uh, for the township staff, uh, what we've done in the past is we've closed the office from like 11 until one or 11 until two, we'll do the same thing. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that. Um, we are, uh, the next thing down on the list is the CDCA loan. So I just wanna real quick, uh, John Gillen, who you appointed to cover the CDCA for us as our representative has shared with me that the CDCA is going for a PenVest loan. Um, in, in doing so, PenVest is requiring that the CDCA 
say that they will go back to PenVest for any future borrowings up for before approval. So let's say that the they borrow six million for this project and they want to borrow another six million a year from now. They PenVest has to sign off on it. They can actually say no. Um, so uh, John and I talked and John and I both had the same initial response was that we were a little bit concerned on that, yeah. uh, that you know, you're giving away the ability for them to borrow as they need mm -hmm. to. Um, what I do know is that PenVest usually doesn't say no unless, it's, <clears throat> unless they feel like they're at risk for their borrowing. However, um, I still think that anytime that's on there, that makes it tough. Mm -hmm. for, for them to do what they need to do. Unless this board disagrees with my recommendation to John is that I would have Newtown vote no on that. And if I'm seeing a couple of you wait, shake your heads yes, but if you, unless you were to say no, we'll just, we will be voting no on that move going forward. Supervisor Partridge, are you fine with that? He's on, he's on mute. You're muted. Yes, I'm fine with it, Lynn. Yeah, you're good then. Okay, thank you. Um, the next thing down, uh, I think I reported back probably, I don't know, four or five months ago that Pico was going to do, uh, remove some trees along Goshen Road. They had never came in and actually did it. Uh, they did mark them, but they didn't actually re remove them. We've now actually gotten the request to actually do the work. So if you see Pico removing trees, they have been trees that the arborist has looked at Actually, I think there was two additional trees the arborist thought ought to be removed um, that they're, we're asking Pico to do at the same time uh, that they're there. So just know that that was something that the arborist has reviewed uh, and we have, and we will be signing off on just so you know. How many of them are there? Ballpark. Do you remember, George, was it seven, 10? I don't even remember. It's seven. It's seventeen trees okay. along the Goshen Trail. Most of them are ash trees. Yep. And again, the the arborist and I walked them and, and looked at each one of them, and they were all showing uh, signs of decline. Okay. I need it here. Thank you. Any questions for the township manager? I have one last thing. Go ahead, Mr. Sorry Mr. about that. Nope. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to let you know the the document that you had approved by for with Nell uh, for the extension. Uh, the municipal authority has approved that. Great. Anything else, Mr. Neese? That's it. Any questions for the township manager? Seeing now we're going to move down to the budget adjustments, section 10, 10.1. Can I get a motion to approve the budget increase 2022-06, increasing the capital fund budget as follows, increasing revenue account 30-300-00-279-0.00, uh, use of fund balance by $31,441, increasing expense account 30-430-90-742.02 RTV and attachments by $31,441, the increase will come from the use of fund balance. The Kabuta RTV was budgeted and ordered in 2021. The RTV was anticipated to be received in 2021, but due to supply shortages, the RTV was not received until August of 2022. I'll move. Second. Motion was made by Supervisor uh, Roberts Lightcap, seconded by Supervisor Chanless. Is there any board discussion? George, can you explain what's going on here? Certainly. So this was a piece of equipment from the capital budget for 2021. Uh, it's actually a piece of equipment that you had asked, what was the status on? We were waiting for it to show up. It finally showed up in, in August. So uh, the money was uh, identified at the end of the year in 2021, but it wasn't actually uh, specifically put into the budget as a line item for 2022 because we thought it was coming imminently. And, and then when it didn't, we couldn't do anything in the first several months of, of 2023. So this is not a $31,000 increase in cost. No, the money was, was it just available has to be and transferred budgeted. from one year to the next year. Exactly. Okay. This is That's making the, the movement. For Thank you. You already allocated it. Yeah. Any other board discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Let's oppose. Motion carries unanimously. 10.2. Can I, get a motion, uh, can I get a motion approving the budget increase 2022-07, increasing the general fund budget as follows, increasing revenue account 01-300-00-279.00, use of fund balance by $17,998, increasing expense account uh, number 01-433-70-4. 
84.00 signal repairs other by $17,998. The increase will come from the use of fund balance at the February 28, 2022 Board of Supervisors meeting. Approval was received for installation of advanced detection westbound and eastbound on Westchester Pike at Alice Grimm Boulevard to replace failed volume density loops and turn lane loops. Budget movements were not, made, were not able to be made due to the time of the year, so Public Works hope to absorb the cost within the general operating budget for signal repairs. However, the other signal repairs throughout the year have utilized funds so that the budget increase is now necessary to cover the cost at Alex, Alex Grimm Boulevard. Second. Motion was made by Supervisor Chandler, seconded by Supervisor Roberts. Light cap, is there any board discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries unanimously. Well, I'll move down to payments 11.1. Consider approving the following court order tax reduction refunds $6,181.59 payment to Campus Investors Office BLP at 3843 Westchester Pike for the 2020 tax year, $4,665.22 payment to Campus Investors Office BLP at 3843 Westchester Pike for the 2019 tax year and $1,685.63 payment to Megan and Paul Nolan at 23 Hunt Valley Lane for the 2022 tax year. So moved. Motion was made by Supervisor Robert Lightcap, seconded by Supervisor Chandless. Is there any board discussion? I'd like, I'd like Mr. Neese to explain to us why we're... I'd like Mr. Neese to explain to us, is this a lawsuit resolution that is going back three years? Well, this is, these are um, people taxes. that have gone and appealed their taxes yeah. for whatever reason. How, and this how do you is what they so far back because I thought so, you had to go the. Well, it's only taxes. two years back. Yeah. It probably, what happens is once you file it and it goes to the Board of Assessment, if you lose the Board of Assessment, you have an appeal right to the Court of Common Pleas. So this probably got appealed back in 2019 or 2020 for the 2019 taxes. And then it was just held up in litigation and it finally got heard. Oh, okay. It's a long. Um, Backball. Sorry to interject. All right. That, Thank you. That's fine. Any other board discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those motion carries unanimously. 11.2. Can I get a motion approving the refund of $75 room rental fee payable to Associa Mid Atlantic for the annual Mirrorwood HOA meeting, which needed to be canceled? So moved. Second. Motion was made by Supervisor Roberts Lightcap, seconded by Supervisor Chandless. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries unanimously. Section 12, bills. I will make a motion to approve the bills on check register A dated September 26, 2022, totaling $414,220.31. Second. Motion was made by the chair, seconded by Supervisor Chandless. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries unanimously. I will make a motion to approve the bills on check register B dated September 26, 2022, totaling $2,284,000. This is a move. This is to move money from the township's current accounting to PLGIT to invest as approved at the September 12, 2022 board meeting. Second. Motion was made by the chair, seconded by Supervisor Robert Slaycap. Is there any board discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Section 13, developer release. I get a motion approving escrow release PH1 for Lister PH1 totaling $401,889.50 for site work and reaffirm the previously approved sanitary release number seven for $64,380 at the October 10, 2016 board meeting and number eight for $297,087.19 at the April 22nd, 2019 board meeting totaling $361,467.19 as requested by Toll Brothers. So moved. Second. Motion was made by Supervisor Partridge, seconded by Supervisor Robert Lightcap. Is there any board discussion? I will just note that, um, as alluded to with the BPG development, I have recently transferred firms. We're in the process of going through our conflict um, checks. Uh, we, my firm, does have a history of representing Toll Brothers. While I am not involved in this pro property or project, I should say. Um, until the conflict checks are completely resolved, I will be abstaining from this. Oh, I just had a quick question. Why do we need to reaffirm the previously approved release? It is my understanding, even though you acted on this before, it would, they never acted on the release, whether we didn't give it to them properly or whether Toll Brothers didn't take it once we gave it to them. It's a little bit in question. <clears throat> I thought we signed all the documents, but 
uh, that was never released. So they've been now asking for it so they can be fully released. Any other board discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries four to nothing with one abstention. All right, we're now gonna go a little bit out of order. We're gonna move the school district up so we can get Mr. Petroza out of here. Um, as much as we would love to have you though, I know that just came off a little wrong. Uh, so we're gonna jump down to uh, section 16, land development approval. If we can, uh, Mr. Petroza, um, I'll let you just go and do your presentation and then we'll, yeah, we'll do the formalities after that. This is uh, nothing with, with no overcap. So the plan is the personal list. I should Mr. also know, Mr. Chair, before. I was just about to note that. What? The, the switch. We're going to switch, but I also, is there anything on the agenda that you feel like you need uh, Mr. Johnson to stay for? Um, I, I will a quick look through. I didn't see anything. You're going to potentially approve his bid earlier, later for Pannoni for the sidewalk out here. But other than that, I didn't see anything. So I didn't know if we could release him for the evening. I don't want to ask him in public if you have a conflict, but um, is there, why else would he be leaving? Well, I, the, the, there's, uh, if there's nothing else on the agenda and, he, yeah. and you're going to go through this yeah. versus having him sit here and us pay for him to sit here while we do all of this. I was just releasing him. It, it, I'm being cheap, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever the board wants to do. I'm, I'm fine five. with it. I'm fine with it. <clears throat> There's three. Have a good evening. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, Mr. Petroza, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Don Petroza. I'm here representing the Marple Newtown School District in connection with a proposed new addition to Culbertson Elementary School at 3530 Goshen Road. With me this evening are Jake Gallagher, Director of Operations for the District. Uh, Culbertson Principal Jim Wigo is here. Uh, architect and District Consultant Pete Medica of Manette Associates is here. And Project Engineer Mike Kissinger of Pannoni Associates is also here. And there's also a, a board member here, Tony uh, Maloof, is here uh, as well. Take one note, Mr. Petroza. Um, since Pannoni is working on this project, we have Stantec coming in as conflict engineer. So it's great to see Giovanna again. I just want to make sure that's clear for the record. Continue. Sure. And what is proposed, it, it, it's a very simple presentation. It's a one-story building addition of uh, approximately 11,700 square feet. And it's located towards the northeast portion of the property along Goshen Road between the visitor parking lot and the uh, soccer field. The plans are prepared by Pannoni Associates uh, dated June 28th, uh, 2022. There's a uh, subsurface uh, stormwater basin proposed under the soccer field towards the front of the property. And we wanted to keep the stormwater management facilities away from the folks on uh, Tyson Road who had some issues uh, with the last uh, project at, at Culbertson. And um, we have several reviews, uh, and I'll just mention what they are, but they're all, we don't have any problem with any of them. We have a fire marshal review letter dated July 12th, 2022. And we believe we've resolved all those issues with the fire marshal. Uh, we have a Delaware County Planning Department review letter dated August 19th, 2020, recommending approval. We have the Arborist review dated July 13th, 2022, saying no further action is required. We have a McCombie review dated July 27th, 2022. We have a Stantec review dated July 21st, 2022, and an action memo from the Township Planning Commission dated July 29th, 2022, recommending uh, preliminary and final approval. As noted in the Stantec review and the Planning, Com uh, Planning Commission's action memo, three waivers were requested and recommended by the Planning Commission. Uh, the first is 148-12 to allow a combined preliminary slash final plan. 148-21A, and I believe it's also 148-21B, uh, to allow plan size of 30 inches by 42 inches instead of 24 inches by 36 inches. And then section 148-43B4 to use HDPE pipe instead of reinforced concrete pipe, except for in a couple of particular areas where the uh, township engineer prefers to have uh, concrete pipe. And, um, 
if you, if there are any engineering questions, uh, Mike Kissinger is here to address those or answer any of those. And if there are any other questions about the project, I think either uh, Jake Gallagher or Pete Medica uh, would be happy to uh, try to answer. Them. Perfect. Thank you, Don. Uh, as you have three former school board members sitting up here, right? Two former school board presidents. So this is going to be a tough crowd for you this evening. Um, one thing I do want to ask, right, wrong, or different, and this is going to be for your engineer, right, wrong, or different, the school district is blamed a lot now for the flooding that occurs in the back of that, uh, in the back of Culberton. Can you just have your engineer kind of touch on what you all are doing for stormwater, for stormwater um, as it relates to this project? And maybe it might be good because we do get a large contingency of individuals who watch us live um, who might be watching this to kind of go over what you did, you know, in that prior project as well. Sure. Uh, again, uh, Don uh, mentioned my name, but my name is uh, Michael Kissinger with Pannonia Associates. That's all correct. Is that my friend? Yeah, I think so. Yes. There you go. Um, <clears throat> So, um, am I allowed to walk with this? You can. So, okay. So, uh, I'll go to the previous project first. Yep. Um, so, on the south side of the parcel, on the very far bottom of the plan, for people looking at home, there is a uh, above ground basin <clears throat> that is shown in that area. That pipe cuts through the properties and comes out in there. So, a lot of the conversations with the neighbors were revolving around that, that uh, off site pipe. Um, there's additionally a stormwater basin on the top right in the parking lot uh, along Goshen Road that was also installed. Well, this thing had a light on it too. <laughs> but so at the far top, it just went off there. Yeah, there's a chamber system right there in the parking lot. And, and that's quite a large underground system underneath the parking lot. Um, what we propose, there, there was also a smaller systems throughout. But what, so what we propose in the current uh, plan is actually all along Goshen Road. So what we have is a, there you can see a box there that's, it's phantomed out uh, underneath the side of the soccer field. That is where the underground basin for the structure will go. And we're really working our hardest to keep, like I said, all the stormwater going to Goshen Road, knowing that the challenges that the neighbor, neighbors have had in the past. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to keep going to my questions. I don't have any more for you. The next one might be a uh, Mr. Wygo question uh, or Pete Medici question. The first one I'll go with, and, and again, I just want to have this addressed. When people ask us, well, why is the school district doing this now as opposed to when they did it the first time around? Mr. Petrozzi, you might be actually the proper one to answer this. There is indeed actually a statute in the Commonwealth that we commonly call as the Taj Mahal Act, where school districts are only allowed a certain percentage of, um, you know, renovation or construction space before it gets triggered for a referendum. Uh, and at the time that the school district went through the first phase of this renovation project where Supervisor Chalice and I were both on the board, we were completely fine uh, with regards to capacity. This is sort of a double-edged sword in the sense that, you know, that's one piece out there. But the other piece too is that this program is just that, a program that we're speaking about, probably you know, one of the most state-of-the-art, sophisticated um, special education programs that this county and Commonwealth has, and it houses the Autistic Support Program. Um, and a lot of people don't know that until we, we bring that up. And this program uh, houses the entire Autistic Support Program for the district. So all four of our elementary schools come here uh, for this remarkable service, right? Um, and it's something that's been around, I would say, what, since the 70s, 80s? Um, so I guess if you can kind of just touch on those two points, um, I think it's important to have that fleshed out. Sure. Uh, and I'll let uh, Pete come up in, in a minute. I, I do want to indicate, and I think the, the board probably knows this, but at one point there was consideration about the possibility of moving the autistic support program to another location. And uh, that's why it wasn't really considered uh, at the time that we came in on the last project. And what I think the board discovered and uh, probably no, none of us realized the extent of the impact that that has on the, uh, the children and the parents that are in the program. In fact, I think there's one of the, one of the parents is here tonight who could- uh, have another parent another, as well. Another, Who's a parent then, of an alum. 
Sure. They were quite, quite upset about the prospect uh, of change. You know, change is not a good thing for people in this program. They, they, they get used to a certain routine. And it became apparent to the school board that the, that the program had to stay at this location. And, and that's, that's one of the reasons. Pete, do you want to add uh, to that? Yeah. Yeah, Peter Medica with Bonnet Associates. Uh, so just to speak to the Act 34 question, the Taj Mahal Act, uh, when the project was first uh, put through that process, uh, the project fully complied with Act 34 and the uh, Taj Mahal requirements, which require you to stay within certain financial and uh, uh, accounting parameters within the project through the state. Uh, we ran that through Department of Education and everything checked out. When this project came online, naturally, that was a question whether or not there'd be any conflict with the previous uh, project. We got confirmation from the state that since that project had been completed, and this is a legitimate new start to a project that it does not conflict with the prior project. Thank you. I think that's it for me right now. Does any other board member have anything they want to add? Uh, just to piggyback off of um, what Don had uh, said, I have a son, just personal, I have a son who is a freshman at Lebanon Valley College right now studying music education. And in third, I'm sorry, but in third grade, he was um, diagnosed with as, uh, as Asperger's. He has gone through the Marple Newtown School District and, and it all started from Culbertson. So they've done a wonderful job. That's all I can say. So, and he's happy and he's thriving and he has fit in and he's socially adapted. And so I always want to thank Mr. Wygo and, and the staff at Culbertson Elementary that Sam Whitecap is a healthy, happy freshman at college. So thank you all. Um, I will now turn it over if there's any members of the public who have anything that they want to add. Um, you can come up to the microphone, state your name and address for the record. Um, thank you for this time. Uh, my name is Matt Holmes. I'm speaking to you as a, can you hear me okay? Yes. Concerned you, citizen and parent of a child who attends Culbertson uh, Matt, Elementary what is School. Your, what, you said Matt, right? Matt. And last name? Holmes. And what is your address, Matt? 3704 Chase Court. You're good. Um, so uh, my son participates in the supplemental ASD program. And if you don't know the, the brief history, but six months ago, we were all contacted out of the blue that the program was going to be moved. We weren't consulted, we weren't anything. And so we've had a lot of meetings with the school board. I've been at every one of them. I've been asked by a lot of parents to talk here. So I talked to the planning committee, the zoning committee. And so I'm going to talk to you about what I shared there. Um, and so I'll tell you that for those that are unaware, Culbertson started this ASD program, it's actually 20 years ago, which to be honest is way ahead of its time. Um, it's an amazing, unique program. Mr. Wygo is just incredible. Um, and as a parent of a child with ASD, I really struggle to explain it to people. So it's really great to hear you sharing that because I know people who don't really spend consistent time with anyone with ASD, they can't really fully understand its true impact. Um, it's not easy to explain and it's not easy to understand. And I can declare that it, what I can declare though, is it completely dominates an, any family's life who lives with anyone who has it. Everything is structured around that kid. Um, and it truly is a spectrum. It greatly varies from person to person. No two people are alike. They don't use Asperger's anymore. It's all spectrum. Um, kids can look very much like they have ADHD, OCD, speech challenges, sensory issues, behaviors that can draw attention tapping. My son does a lot of tapping. Um, and they can have intense emotional meltdowns over complete trivial things. And some have severe mental challenges and others have genius level intellect. But at its core, the most common characteristic are social and communication challenges and adjusting to changes to an established routine. It now affects one out of every 44 children. And it's the fastest growing developmental disorder over the last 20 years. So Culbertson was indeed way ahead of its time. And a central theme to autism education is not just awareness of what it is, but what's called autism acceptance as kids with ASD are easy targets for bullies because their condition is not visibly obvious most of the time as compared to other disorders. So autism acceptance is where Culbertson is really incredible. Um, and it's very unique. 
it's not just the amazing faculty and educators and aides and curriculum, the program itself, but it's the fact that there's an overall fully integrated ASD acceptance and awareness culture in the entire school environment. And it's really the other kids that make it work because they're educated and they're taught and they're accepting and that makes a huge deal. Um, and this has been cultivated over 20 years with countless examples I can list out to prove how it's different. And so Culbertson's ASD program, the overall culture and environment, it works amazing for these kids. And our son had an amazing kindergarten last year. And you cannot just copy and paste this into a new school location. It would take years, kids would regress. I'll share personally through the pandemic, we had so much trouble and um, we were desperate. And I can tell you that we participated in a very cutting edge stem cell therapy treatment study at Duke University. Duke is the world leader in autistic and brain research. And only 600 kids in the world have ever gotten this kind of therapy in the US. My son, and actually another Culbertson student, out of the 165 kids that they're trying to enroll for the study, two from the same elementary school. And I can tell you when we went there and we spent four days over two different visits, eight days, we told them about what Culbertson did they said that is one of the best programs we've ever heard of. So I just want everybody in Marple to know what you have, okay? And so everything you can do to keep the teachers that you have here and the program that you have here is really the crown jewel of this whole school district, okay? Um, uh, so I just think people don't know that. And so most kids, they're not even aware that they have this, it's exhausting, their emotions are all over the place. When you deviate from their routine, it is like the end of the world. So to move this program away from Culbertson is a big mistake on many levels. Not only is it the crown jewel example, the best that Marple Town School District Education has to offer, but really it's a model replicated at other schools, other schools in the state that have way higher rankings, no offense to Marple Town, but Conestoga, Laura Marion, Radner, I know teachers. I went to college with teachers who were there and they said Culbertson is the best autism program in the state. So um, if this program moves from Culbertson, these kids will regress, they'll go backwards and it'll damage Marble New Town's reputation. I don't think you'll find one parent who would argue that their child isn't thriving at Culbertson. And you, know, you really need to do whatever it takes and don't take one of the few certainties of their lives away. The school board has done their part. You said there's three former school board people that have served here. Matt Bilker and the school board are behind this. Mr. Wago's behind this. So I'm asking you to be behind it and approve the motion. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Any other public comment? <clears throat> Thank you so much for your story, by the way. It really is very encouraging to me as a mother um, with a child with special needs. Um, my son, Brady, he um, has a genetic disease and it's one of the leading genetic causes of autism. And um, we went through the process of trying to find a, a school that was a good fit for him and finally found Culbertson <laughs> um, and is truly meeting his needs. He is now, when I say thriving, it's, that's an understatement. Um, he comes home from school and he's, he's reading, he is writing, he's happy, he's um, starting math at eight years old. And um, he has a team of therapists that support him and go above and beyond. I mean, these people um, check in with me, they send notes home. Um, so there's a continuity at home for me to teach him what he's learning in school. And they really truly care. I mean, I can tell when I drop him off at school, his one-on-one -on -one comes out and we've just developed such a nice rapport. I mean. She shows good eye, eye contact. Um, she really, really cares about my son. Um, and so the issue is when we found out that the school was moving, um, obviously, you know, we we're let down, but we also knew that this would be devastating to Brady because transitions are hard with, with kids with autism. Um, he needs a routine and he needs to be around the same people, familiar faces. And to move him out of that environment into a new environment, most likely he would regress, as Matt had said. Um, and that would really, really be tough. And then we would have to go back and start all over again. So I'm happy 
to hear that the school is going to be staying where it is. And I just, I think it's so important um, that these kids continue um, with the, the familiar teachers and whatever we can do to keep the teachers there and the staff in place. Um, Mr. Wygo has just been so wonderful, um, very transparent. Um, you know, when I call him, he calls right back. It's just, it's nice to have a principal that has their door open and is very genuine, down to earth, humble, and just over an, overall a good person and principal. Um, so I just, again, want to just mention that um, we are thankful, you know, thankful for the district because it did take some time to find a good place for Brady. Um, but uh, anything that we can do as parents to continue to keep this moving in the right direction, um, you know, feel free to reach out. But um, again, thank you. And thank you for, you know, uh, inviting me to this meeting. And my husband was at the last meeting. So thank you very much. Excuse me, may I have your name and address? Please? Oh, yes. Yeah, so it's Heidi Leone. And my address is 15 Woolman Drive. Thank you. And that's Newtown Square, obviously. So thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Uh, good evening, Anthony Maloof, 202 First Avenue. Um, I am appearing here uh, as a member of Newtown, as a member of the Newtown community, but also as a, as a representative of the Marple Newtown School Board. And uh, it, it can't even follow uh, what's been said earlier. I will say that uh, in my capacity as a member of the school board in his first year, this uh, listening to the members of the community speak about the importance of this program being at this school was um, illuminating uh, and eye-opening. So the, the board is fully behind this proposal and we do urge that you adopt items 16-1 and 17-1. Thank you very much, Mr. Maloof. Any other members of the public? All right, and I'm guessing there's no other board comment. Mr. Petroza, do you have anything else you wanna add? Thank you very much. With that being said, I will make a motion to approve the preliminary final land development plan for Culbertson Elementary School as approved by the Planning Commission. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion was made by the chair, seconded by Supervisor Chanless. Is there any board discussion? Uh, the only thing I will add is that the Newtown Township community is proud uh, to have this program here in our, in our municipality. Um, we are proud of the work that the Culbertson Elementary School community has done, not just for this program, but for all the students that it educates. And as I alluded to earlier, there are three former school board members on this board. Uh, our solicitor is a former school board member as well. Um, so. We are very proud to see this project, this program stay here, and we look forward to hearing of the continued successes of it, Mr. Wygo and Mr. Maloof. So thank you all very much. With that being said, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Excuse me. Aye. 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 Approval resolution. Well, I'm going to have the, the next item is 17.1, where I was going to have them read the resolution. That's the, I, I would combine the seven. You want, me to, you want me to do it together? Okay. So with that being said, um, Ms. Supervisor Roberts Icap, if you can read that resolution, please. Resolution 2022-29, uh, preliminary final land development approval. 3520 Goshen Road, Marple Newtown School District, Culbertson Elementary School, second building addition to accommodate classrooms and special education program. Be it resolved that the supervisors of Newtown Township hereby, hereby resolves and conditionally approves one, the plan. Two, the following waivers and or partial waivers, which must be set forth on the final report of plans as follows. A, section 148-43B4, uh, to allow the use of high density H HDPE in place of RCP in the conveyance system. RCP will be used in the basin inlet outlet structures as required by the township manager. B, section 148-21A1 and 14822A2 related to plan size. And C, section 148-12 to allow submission of preliminary slash final plans. Three, such approval is subject to developer obtaining an approved sewage plan planning module for land development 
or other applicable approval or waivers and any necessary approvals from the township, Newtown Township Municipal Authority for sanitary sewer connection design or use. Four, such approval is subject to satisfactory resolution of any terms and conditions of the aforementioned township engineer review letter, fire marshal letter, and arborist review letter, which have not already been resolved. Five, such approval is subject to terms and conditions of the aforementioned variances granted by the zoning hearing board. Six, developers shall execute a stormwater management and maintenance agreement and contribute to the township stormwater management maintenance fund. Seven, developers shall obtain all necessary permits, including but not limited to highway occupancy permit and an NPDES permit for stormwater discharge is applicable. Six, developers shall comply in all respects with all applicable township codes, ordinances, resolutions, as well as any applicable uh, county, state, federal regulations and developer must obtain uh, applicable township, state, county and federal permits, approvals and or waivers, including but not limited to a, a highway occupancy permit and NPDS permit for stormwater discharge. Nine, preliminary final approval is contingent upon payment of all outstanding professional fees escrow replenishment within 45 days of approval, except as pro properly challenged in accordance with the Municipal Planning Code. Resolve this 26th day of September, 2022 at the public meeting of the Board of Supervisors. That's my motion. Yeah, might as well, we'll do it that way. The motion was made by Supervisor Robert Cap, seconded by Supervisor Chandless. Any other board discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, thank you very much. I'll also add, I don't think I've ever heard anyone speak so highly of the school board before. I think you can tell you around a school all board meeting. Time. No, nope. just all the time, all just the time, all the time. I do it all the time. Thank you, everyone. You guys Especially can all Especially Culbertson. We'll move down into uh, section 14, new business, 14.1. Again, a motion to approve the permission to advertise for all open slash expiring board commissions and committee positions. So moved. So moved. Motion was made by Supervisor Partridge, seconded by Supervisor Robert Slightcap. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. 14.2, consider waiving the township associated fees for Garrett Williamson's Harvard Festival. I'll wait until this is done. Fourteen point two. Consider waiving the township associated fees for Garrett Williamson's Harvest Festival on October fifteenth, two thousand twenty-two. I just need to abstain. So moved. Second. Motion was made by Supervisor Roberts Lightcap, seconded by Supervisor Partridge. In case you couldn't hear that, Supervisor Chainless needs to abstain. I need to abstain as well since I'm on the foundation board. With that being said, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries uh, three to nothing with two abstentions. 14.3, consider approving the proposal from engineering Pannoni, from engineering Pannoni for the Ellis Avenue sidewalk design at an estimated cost of $85,000. Some of for approval. Motion is made by Supervisor Partridge, seconded by Supervisor Chandler. So, do you wanna add anything on this? I, I would just say that this was, we had a, a prior a bid on this that I believe was about 124,000. You asked me to go back and find another bid. This is the one we got with our new engineer. Uh, so obviously fairly big savings and uh, they will start this uh, and then we'll look for a construction in the early spring because of the, it's gonna be too late to get it done this fall with yeah. concrete. Any board comment? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, for 14.4, I'll make a motion to table. Second. Motion was made and seconded. You don't need a vote for that. 14.5, can I get a motion to consider accepting the resignation of Richard Lafayette as the Township Finance Director, effective October 21st, 2022? Second. Motion was made begrudgingly by Supervisor Chanless and begrudgingly seconded by Supervisor Robert Sightcap. Is there any board discussion? All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, 
That was the saddest yes votes I've ever heard, but congratulations again, Rich. 14.6, can I get a motion approving the staff request to contract with Dallas Data for accounting support at a cost of $75 per hour while searching for a new finance director? So moved. Motion is made by Supervisor Chandler, seconded by Supervisor Partridge. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion carries unanimously. 14.7, can I get a motion to consider authorizing the staff to hire a search firm to assist with selecting a new finance director not to exceed $10,000? Second. Motion is made by Supervisor Chandler, seconded by Supervisor Partridge. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion carries unanimously. 14.8, can I get a motion, or can we do, we'll do the discussion with possible decision about a sponsorship for the Marple Newtown High School 52nd Annual Bandorama? Get a motion and all that. So moved. Motion was made by Supervisor Russo, seconded by Supervisor Chandler. Is there any board discussion? I do have. So we need to pick the amount that we want. What we'll did we do before? We've never done it before. I thought we did. No, not for Bandorama, according to them. Um, Marple Township does a $300 one, uh, which gives them a full page. And I think that's what we should do too. Yep. That's fine. 300 is fine. 300 is so moved. Second. It doesn't matter. Motion was made to, I got it. I knew I had it somewhere in this pile. So uh, the motion was for $300. Motion was made by Supervisor Chandler, seconded by Supervisor Partridge. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those motion carries unanimously. Suzanne, I'm going to give this to you because it's got to get to him first thing tomorrow morning. All right. 14.9, uh, can, can I get a motion to approve the closing of Chapel Road and St. Albans Circle from 5 to 7 p.m. on December 4th, 2022 for the annual tree lighting celebration? So moved. Second. Motion was made by Supervisor Roberts Lightcap, seconded by Supervisor Chandless. I see Mr. Seligson walking up. Do you want to add anything to that? Nope. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could just make one statement. I yes. know you've approved this. Uh, but just in case the public starts seeing action at the circle, yep. uh, that action would be for preparing for the tree yep. uh, so that people understand that that's what's happening. We're not trying to tear it out or anything like that. It's preparing for the tree. And uh, we'll hopefully have a sign up there saying that. But that's I just wanted everybody to know that. I do want to make a clarification. It's December 4th, not 6th. And I say the 4th? Okay. Yep, it's on the right. agenda. Thank you. I just was reading what was here. Okay. All right. Uh, well, it says December 4th on this. Yeah, that's what I said. Oh, yeah. Okay. So 14, 1410, can I get a motion? Uh, we'll do discussion and possible direction about the 2023 Hang Basket Initiative. Mr. Seligson. So if you want, uh, we had 36 instances of watering. And each watering took, took roughly sometimes an hour and a half to two hours. I want to really thank, and this takes me just a second, Paul Seligson, I'm chairman of Newtown Square uh, uh, in Bloom. So the people that did the watering are as follows. Cheryl Grasso, Margie Dockery, Leonard Altieri, Lisa Borowski, Tina roberts Lightcap, myself, Debbie Warden, and a, a really huge shout out to Lewis Rosenthal, who did about 18 times of this watering. And then midway through, we found an a -A ARD person, and his name is Andrew Lisi. And he did it for, I would say, 12 times or something like that, but quite a few. So mostly, it's we're spending roughly between an hour and a half to two hours per water. So the question is, do you, um, and, and I need to tell you that um, because of the widening, if, uh, Westchester Pike, I don't think it's going to be finished by June. Do you? I mean, that's a question. I don't know that answer. I don't think so, but I, I don't so, think so. So we have, we had 76 baskets this year. If we subtract 20 baskets, the difference between uh, where the Westchester Pike is going to be widened between this year and last and next year is going to be 20. So subtracting that, we're talking roughly 56 baskets. That's what we're talking. Um, Fifty-six. Okay. 
and the question is twofold. Do you want to do you want to repeat exactly how we did it this year, or should we? Uh, or can I ask for two people, one person to drive the truck and one person to water? Well, let's do this. Let's get all the questions out now. And then what I think is probably the best thing to do is to collect that information, have the staff go back and look at the information uh, and then provide us, not to put either of you on the spot, but I, I think it's important that, um, well, you, George, in particular, should be opining on this. But I think it's also important for you to, to kind of give us it as well. Um, so I think that what we should do for tonight is continue to provide us what you're providing now, what you think the plan will be for next year. Any board members have any, have any questions or clarifications, let's get them out tonight as well. Uh, and then come back to, I want George and Steve to look at it and, and, and provide some information to us as well. So we'll give you a memo for the next meeting so that you can have yeah, information. Yeah, that actually works perfectly. And lastly, I'm, I, I'm letting you know that I'm gonna be resigning from the hanging baskets as of January 1st, 2025. So I'm gonna do it for 23 and I'll do it for 24. But by 25, I would like another person to pop up. Have you started recruiting anyone yet? Well, I'm asking Newtown Square and Bloom. I haven't found anybody. Thank you. All right, perfect. Thank you, Paul. All right, we're now gonna move. So um, we'll now move down to 15, oh, excuse me, 1411. That was the motion that we added in there. And can I get a motion to approve the retention of a grant writer for an amount not to exceed $3,000 to explore and or pursue available agreements for uh, available grants for police department equipment? Second. Second. Reading hieroglyphics over here. Uh, motion was made by Supervisor Chandler, seconded by Supervisor Partridge. Is there any board discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Section 15, old business. There is no old business. We took care of section 16.1. We took care of section 17.1. We'll now move it down to board comment. If there's any board comment. Okay, I actually don't have anything tonight either. We'll now move it to public comment. Uh, if there's any members of the public who have anything that they wish to add, uh, please state your name and address for the record. Alex Lucas, 33 Dunmaning Road, Newtown Square. Thank you for tabling 14.4, the excess sewer capacity thing. I was shocked to hear the engineer get up here and sorry, he mentioned that it went by really quickly, but he said that Culbertson needed some extra sewer capacity that they weren't going to get. Um, it would be incongruous, I think, for this township to be giving a developer some excess sewer capacity when Culberson's struggling to get it. I would just implore the board and the township and its engineer to work with Culberson to help them find that excess sewer capacity that they need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skoukas. Any other board comment? All right. I'm sorry, any other public comment? Seeing none, we'll move down to items for the next agenda. I'll leave that up to Mr. Neese and the board. With that, we'll get a motion to adjourn. Thank you all very much and have a good evening. Thanks.